Hi, this is Toshio Maeda, the godfather of Tentacle Porn, and you are listening to Anime Pacific. specific podcast. It's episode one of Anime Specific. Anime Pacific, I mean specific. Yes. Yes, it's... <laughs> We're going to have that problem a bit. (laughs) For those of you that don't know, I'm Dane, uh, formerly of the Anime Pacific podcast, and my delightful co-host is... Regan Strongblood, your humble anime slave from the small and very humble Anime 82 podcast, listener of Anime Pacific, now here on Anime Specific. That's right, and I think we should all give uh, Regan at least... either thank him or curse him but he was the one that got me to get back into podcasting i always said i would eventually but you know one year turns into six years and yes. story of my life yes and yeah. dane always promised there'd be no pod date so i, I every once in a while I'd be like dane you can't pod date meanwhile i was pod fading myself i was becoming the thing i was fighting against well what matters is uh, we're back and back. uh let's just talk a little bit about that because we are going to make a monthly show yes okay i know back in the day we could uh, release one episode a week and the episodes could be three or four hours yeah that was you know a decade and change we got kids yeah yes that's right one and i've got all sorts of other things going on as well i mean the funny thing is since stopping podcasting and my co-host alex i've actually been to canada several times I brought a microphone with me on the off chance that we would record something. Went on a massive road trip across uh, Utah, Oregon, Idaho, you know, and spending time in Canada as well. Mm -hmm. But it just never ended up happening. And I've been to Japan like about 10 times. I'm sure we'll get a lot of stories from that, yes. What a good podcaster I am. I didn't even see the name of the website, although I know in in this day and age, it's not as relevant. I mean, even in the anime... specific days yeah um, but i think for for fans who are interested in listening definitely come to our website which day will tell you the address it's brand new i have that's I right saw, and uh i mean come look at some of the neat pictures and also do you have a email address any specific at gmail.com that's any specific at gmail.com that's right and our address is anime specific dot blogspot.com so that's where we can be contacted yeah, well, I did all sorts of cool anime stuff, and I always thought, oh, you know, if I was still podcasting or you know, on YouTube or whatever, then we would really have something cool to yeah. show everyone. Like the, um, for those of you that don't know, I'm a huge fan of uh, yokai, especially Gegege no Kitaro or Hakaba Kitaro, and I made the trek to the the birthplace of uh, Shigeru Mizuki and so his cool. final resting place. So cool, and I'm sure a lot of people don't even know about this place. Yeah, I mean it's. Basically, a Gegege no Kitaro village or, or street, to be exact, with museums and shops and all sorts of stuff. And I, I trekked through. The, I went through the museums. So cool. I, yeah, they got the all the different. They got statues of the characters on the street. Oh, they've got even the train station. So where there is that is located? Out. Like, say in regards to like, say people who don't know Japan very good, say like, how far would it be from say like Tokyo if you were going to take like the speed train or something? Who right. Knows? Well, I went there from Osaka, which it's much faster to go from from that way mm-hmm. uh, and i think uh, it's in a place called sakai minato mm. and if you look that up on google street view you can actually you know see a lot of uh that area and if you go there from osaka and i, I rented a car so Osaka's if you go there probably, from Os- osaka would you say is about is it about four hours from tokyo on the train uh, something like that something like that eh? yeah something yeah. something like that something i mean like if that. you go on the highway mm. or the expressway. So, I mean, it's about three and a half hours by the expressway. Okay. But I didn't go through the expressway. I was traveling with someone who was a bit of a cheapskate. But also, Uh-oh. that worked out really cool anyway, because we stayed in this mountain place, cool. like through Airbnb. Back before like a, all the like an onsen? Came. Like one of those, is it called an onsen? Is that how you say it? 
no, that, that's, that's the hot spring. But um, this was around Easter and it was, I think it was somewhere in Hyogo. And yeah, we had to drive up this mountain with no lights. Like it's pitch black and it's a one way, oh, cool. it's, it's a two way street, but it's only big enough for one car. So it was, you know, not for the faint of heart, mm. but it was actually like a, a, a proper inn and a, or a resort, but it's like a summer resort. So no one was there. It was completely empty and I could yeah. just stay in it by myself. Oh, and nice. Yeah, stayed there and then went through Totori uh, Prefecture when they've got the famous Totori sand dunes, cool. which and are really cool. They've got all these giant sand sculptures and stuff and then all the way to Sakai Minato. So, I mean, that probably ended up being like a six hour plus trip altogether. And you yourself are having been to Osaka. Yeah, I've been to and, Japan. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I've been yeah. to Japan too, guys. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And um, and you were also in Hong Kong, where I live. Yes, and I did. We and made I contacted plans to meet you and stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that it didn't work out. But it would have been totally cool to see you, but ran out of time. Didn't have a lot yes. of time in Hong Kong. Had an absolutely no. great time. I have a great impression of Hong Kong. It's, a, it's actually a beautiful city. We had a great time. But continue with your story, sir. Oh, no, I was just going to say that um, I drove past several museums that mm-hmm. I said I'd check out. And in Totori Province, by the way, um, it's the birthplace of the creator of Detective Conan. So, Which is always uh, on TV in Japan. I noticed. I was yeah. like, one thing that's always on TV, I'm like, Conan. I'm like, oh, it's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's... it's. And you see I, it everywhere I don't on think the street, Tokyo, be, it's still around. Off. Yeah, yeah, and the comic is still in circulation, yeah. and, and it's Gosho Aoyama. Yes, uh, he, yeah, the, the creator of Detective Conan. Yeah, he's from Totori Province, and there's a museum there. Of course, I was way too busy to see it. And I also coincidentally drove past the Osama Tezuka Museum. Yes. And the same thing that happened to me is what happened to you. I said, I'll go there on the way back. Mm-hmm. And on the way back, it was the one day of the week that it was closed. Yes, so. yeah. When I, when I was in Osaka, which is a really cool city, I was Tuesday night. And I, I was with, we were with friends and uh, they wanted to go to Universal Studios in, in Osaka, which I really didn't give two hoots about. It was kind of neat to see kind of like an American themed uh, park in Japan, just like America. It was kind of, it's so, sort of weird, you know, like, okay, it was weird. But um, I, had made, yeah. I had made plans with my wife and my son and our travel, travel friends that the last day in Japan, I was going to take a trip to Takarazuka, which is uh, the town where um, they have the Osamu Tezuka museum i know they also have it's famous for like they're all female musical theater which is pretty cool with the uh, mm-hmm. females playing all the roles which is pretty neat and uh so i was it was all ready to go it was all set up and i was looking into taking i think the bus and uh checked it out and uh of course it was tuesday night wednesday was my last day and wouldn't you know it of all days that's the day the osamu tezuka museum was closed wednesdays only in japan <laughs> i just i just assumed oh it'll be closed on sundays if at all but Word to the wise, if you go to Japan, if you want to go to the Osoma Tezuka Museum, they're closed on Wednesdays. Oh, it broke my heart. It broke yeah. my heart. Oh. I mean, unfortunately, um, with COVID, I mean, because I'm close enough to Japan oh, yeah. that I could literally mm-hmm. go there for a weekend. With COVID, things have been oh, yes, now. thrown topsy-turvy, and I haven't been able to go there for almost a year. I actually went to Kumamoto just as COVID was mm-hmm. starting to erupt. So, yeah, I spent some time in Kumamoto and then I, I booked another ticket just on my own to Nagoya. And cool. that was when all the airlines started stopping flights and all the airports started stopping flights. So I haven't been able to go uh, back there since then. And I actually, but, I, I tried to go, I actually tried to go to the Hayao Miyazaki uh, Museum in Tokyo, which oh, is I went very there. hard to get it. You have to call in advance. I called in advance. I had to call, book a ticket, like book, you have to book in advance. And like, oh, yeah, it's, Insane. What I, I was extremely lucky because I went to a local uh, Tokyo you with yeah. yeah, I went to Tokyo with my daughter uh, last Christmas and cool. tell I us about thought, that oh, museum. You know, I got I, I couldn't get in. I, the, yeah, the well, two big disappointments of Japan is like you want to see Hayao Miyazaki's yeah. museum? No. You want to see Osama Tezuka? Sorry. Ah. Yeah, you you have to you you can't just book tickets online directly from the museum's website or anything like that. Yeah. It, it's really obtuse. Like you've got to go to, uh, for example, Lawson. And I love I love me my Japanese convenience stores, Lawson or Family Mart. Oh. There's certain they they have like a certain quota of tickets and stuff. 
And there's different quotas all around the world uh, of agencies that offer it. And there was one travel agency in Hong Kong that offered it. So what ended up happening was I I sort of went backwards. I uh, inquired in like through Japanese channels and they were all sold out. And then I sort of looked up this place in Hong Kong and asked if they had them. And they said, oh, yes, we've got two left. So I was able to get those. I I found out the information about in Vancouver. And and they they said, yeah, only one you can go, but only one person can go. So it's like, okay, so I have wow. to leave everyone. I have to go by myself. I'm like, okay. So I was like, yeah, oh, screw it. But, but you found a place. You found two tickets. Excellent. You brought your daughter. That's so cool. You go in there. And the unfortunate thing is that in the ground, like in the museum itself, there's mm-hmm. no photography at all. Like oh, not cool. even the lobby or anything like that. It's strictly no camera zone. On the roof uh, and the surrounding gardens, you, you can take the, photos the, out the, there. The big insects? The, the big the giant insects uh, from Nausicaa? Castle in the Sky. The Castle in the Sky. Those robots. So what, what's what's going on in that damn museum? Couldn't get in there. Yeah, so... I heard there's a cat it, bus it, in there. Amazing. Yeah, well, there's, there's like a kid's playroom and there's a restaurant which was just insanely busy. So uh, there's like a little canteen thing as well, just outside. Like it's it's part of the museum. Mm-hmm. Uh, had to eat there. there. A great gift shop. I got oh, a whole man. heap of stuff for my daughter. I got like a... You know, one of those little black creatures from Totoro and a little yeah, white uh, one as well. Dust, a dust fairy, yeah. yeah Actually, when, right. I was in, a... when I was in Kyoto, they have a, they had a uh, store there. So I got oh, some yeah, cool stuff. Yeah. It's cool stuff. A lot of the things there are exclusive. Or I know. It might be the same one as the Ghibli store, but it actually has Ghibli, the Ghibli Museum uh, on its... Cool. Like, they have a lot of gardening it. stuff. Like, I, I love... I have a, like, uh, a big backyard with like lots of trees, and I do a lot of gardening. Mm. So I bought, like, all this gardening stuff. Like, oh, what are my flowers with this cute little... You know? Yeah, I think they had some like little Totoro garden statues and stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, and oh yeah, and uh, they've got exclusive films that they show. Like I think it's total runtime is about fifteen minutes or so. Awesome. Um, that they show in the museum, and they were great. Uh, the one thing was, which was quite surprising to me, was that uh, they were in Japanese only, without any subtitles or or a- anything like that. Mm. And considering yeah the uh, clientele, like you know there were. A lot of Hong Kong people, a lot of people from um, France or, or, or yeah. Russia and all, mm-hmm. all sorts of places. So I was a bit surprised by that. Well, it's almost, they, I think that's got... an issue in Japan in general. Like, I don't know. Did you, I don't know if you've been to like the one. Have you been to the One Piece Tower in uh, Tokyo Tower? Uh, yes. Same thing. Uh, but Everything's yeah. Japanese. You're like, yeah. Funnily enough, when I was in Kumamoto, I, I went out to the sort of the, the countryside um, around Aso, uh, where there's a vo- an active volcano and it was raining at the time, so cool. I had all this sort of black ash in my clothes. Uh, but there is a giant one-piece statue uh, at the uh, Aso station, and it turns out that, uh, yeah, the creator of One Piece, I think he, he was either born there or, um, yeah, I think he was born there. So Yeah, I mean, it's crazy how much One Piece there is. Like, I know they have two theme parks. They have one that's like a, sh- like a, like a based on water. Like pirate ship, and yeah. then they have the one in Tokyo. I went to the one in Tokyo Tower just randomly because we went to Tokyo Tower. It was so crazy, we went to Tokyo Tower, and there was like little kids having a bike race. It was like like four or five year olds having yeah. a bike. I was like, only in Japan, this is crazy, you know? Yeah. Like little BMX, and they're all the little BM- BMXs with their little helmets. It's like cute. I'm like, okay, this is really cool. And then I, I was like, oh, I gotta go to the One Piece One Piece Tower. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm almost like resentful to One Piece in a oh, way because I, I know. I know, I'm not a big. It's, I'm not a big watcher of it. I shouldn't say I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big watcher of it or reader of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it is like, it it is a fantastic comic and cartoon, but it just occupies so much of the zeitgeist that uh, it takes. It takes like it's like Berserk on steroids. It's like let's take this to another level. It yeah, never and it's end. just whenever there's merchandise and and stuff, it's One Piece always gets the priority. Yeah. So exactly. you, you know, it, I know it's it just, everywhere, it, right? I mean, understandably, but still. Yeah, so I mean, my advice to anyone that wants to go to the museum is you really have to prepare well, yeah. well, 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 well in advance. Months, uh, and you we're can talking see, months, yeah. Yeah, you know, if you are in a different continent, for sure. Uh, but there's plenty of photos that you can actually see um, of the interior, and like official photos and stuff. But, um, you know, it, it is, super, like, it's not as big as you think it is. Yeah. Uh, but there's some very cool stuff uh, and a lot of stuff that, that adults might appreciate more than kids. Like uh, there's a lot of early drafts and design drawings and stuff and, and sort of me as like a recreation of Miyazaki's kind of office and his planning st- uh, process and, and stuff. But it, it, 
is really, really very cool. And, yeah, um, and, and it's full of heart, tell, right? It's full of heart. You can tell like he's loved and, and that place is full yeah. of like, it's just full of, um, it's so interesting. All the little artifacts, it's like full of love, just like the Tezuka Museum, the same kind of thing, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's, they don't do anything half-assed in Japan. I know. And you have to it, appreciate really, really, you, really, you have to appreciate the dedication of the Japanese fan. They're into something, they're into it hardcore and they notice yes. things, right? They, they take the time. Maybe it's the Zen in the culture, you know, when yeah. you take the time to enjoy the moment and simple things are also wonderful, you know, and I think that's yeah, what I mean, comes that's through the thing. in Hayao Miyazaki and Tez, Tezuka's work. You know? Yes. And, and, you know, again, speaking about the Gegege no Kitaro Street, I mean, that, that is on a scale that you don't often see. Um, like it is the whole street, um, not just one street, several streets. It's just statues. They've got, yokai in costumes running cool. around it's like Calloway got... park used to be in the 80s there's a place in in calgary called Calloway park it was like flintstone town they lost a the license but it was cool it had everything like little details it's so much fun you know yeah yeah and funnily enough i just google street viewed and the first place i saw was the museum i went to and the restaurant i had noodles at for lunch so uh, yeah, i mean every shop on the street even if it's you know just like an udon shop or something it, you know, it'll be called like Kappa, U, uh, Kappa yeah. Udon or something. You know, there's thematically, it's all the way. Even the police, like even the um, taxis and stuff. It's just like it's a total dedication to. Yeah. And where else in the world? The works. Where else in the world would people who do these famous shows get so much, so much brought to life? Like Japan is yeah. cool, and the countryside is so so beautiful. Yeah, it is really a cool country. We're talking about you know planning months in advance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when it comes to just visiting Japan, like, okay, I have the luxury of living very close to it. So I, I don't, you Rusty know, I know house. I understand there are people living, you know, in, in Saskatchewan or in the Arctic in Brazil. Or, yeah. Yeah. And, and so when, when they go somewhere like to another continent, it's, it's a huge undertaking and, you know, both in terms of planning and financial, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you'd want to go prepared. Whereas yeah. what I often found was, I'd, I'd book a ticket and then I'd say, okay, I'm going to Tokyo. So then I would just use Google Maps and because I, I seldom, you know, I don't fly to Tokyo and then spend a week in Tokyo. I usually rent a car yeah. and I'm, shoom, I'm out there. I'm yeah, out. Yeah, me you too. Know. Last time uh, when we were in Tokyo, you know, I, yeah, I went to Nakano Broadway, got my Project Eco cells. And by sure. the way, you and I, both old school anime fans, oh, yes. right? You, you go to that cell shop in Nakano Broadway and the guy, the dude at the shop, you <laughs> you can me. bring up me. the most obscure OVA and within three seconds, he'll go to his giant shelf, pull out a folder and have cells from it. He'll mm -hmm. know exactly what you're talking about. I'm glad I didn't um, go there so, because I would be broke. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, it, I, I, um, and my, my daughter was with me and, you know, obviously she was born and grew up in the age of digital cells. Mm -hmm. So I really had to explain to her why these are important and why these are special. She's so lucky. She's cool to have a cool anime dad. Like she must, she must have had yeah. a fun time. She's so lucky. <laughs> like my dad would be well, like, my dad was like such a straight lace, just like white, like straight as an arrow. Like I'm going to go mow the lawn. <laughs> be good boy. Let's go to the lawn mowing museum. You in, know? In, in just, so like, it's so Fukushima cool to have a, like, a dad who's taking you to Japan. Like, man, that, I, did she have a really good time? Like, did she, did she enjoy herself? Oh yeah. Well, what we oh, did, okay. So th this is what I mean, like, you, because relative to Hong Kong, obviously, it's such a huge place. So I, I can mm -hmm. zoom in and I'll go, OK, uh, let me see. Nico. All right, let's go there. And then I would I would zoom in and I'll be like, oh, Edo Wonderland. All right. So I'll book a hot spring there and we'll go to Edo Wonderland. Done. Cool. And, you know, like I, I didn't research it or anything. I just saw it on Google Maps, went to Edo Wonderland and you know, had a, a ball like my daughter rented a ninja suit like and you know you can cool. and um you know you can just walk around it's like an mm -hmm. edo period place they got a ninja house they got ninja stars they got archery all sorts of activities for the kids so it was just so cool and and again it wasn't something like i had long planned oh i'm gonna go to edo wonderland one day i just zoomed in on the map saw the attractions nearby said that looks great and, and went there and that's about you um, going without friends like when I went, we had friends, so I had to kind of placate, go to some places I didn't necessarily want to go. But if you're just you and your daughter, man, that'd be awesome. Like if just me and my yeah. son went, sweet. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I've gone in the past with Women. more people. and Let's go shopping. It, no! Yeah. Well, it can just be very frustrating because yeah. a lot of people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. It's like we're like, diehard anime fans. This is our opportunity. 
you'll make us go to some like like i love going to the shrines i'll go to every yeah. single shrine in japan happily mm. go to all the temples i love that stuff well, kyoto's amazing but, but like the, the the temples there are a trip like, they're amazing oh yeah oh. for sure if you guys go and, to japan go to kyoto go to the temples golden temple yep, but go yep. ahead uh be careful of those deers though my daughter started to fall in love with them and then this really aggressive one butted her so don't worry we're canadian we know all about that <laughs> yeah. yeah but yeah, no, what you were saying like about about my daughter you know having an anime dad and stuff i mean to an extent yes like she grew up as a baby like mm -hmm. practically as a toddler watching Project Deco and stuff. That's a favorite of mine. Blu-rays on the way. We'll definitely and, review that And of course, that Hong Kong out. has a lot of uh, past with of anime shows, just like my wife's Filipina. In the Philippines, tons of anime oh, yeah. come in there, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. that's right. And yeah, I mean, and Hong Kong is a huge producer, or at least it was, uh, of toys back in the day. But now what they, uh, you know, obviously a lot of that stuff is done in China and, and whatnot. But a lot of people have like super nostalgia for Black very Cat? particular is Black shows. There's, there's a show um, called Black Hat, isn't it? I went but, down to Comic Alley where they have all these characters in Hong Kong. Characters mm. I didn't know, like there's a pig, it's called Mick McDull, some, yeah. Mick Doll, and like a bunch of characters that look like guys from Fist of the North Star. You know that? You've been there. Cartoon Alley or oh, yeah. yeah. Hong Kong. They have their yeah, own cartoons um, too, right? In comics. Uh, there's not a lot of... Well, they did. Like, McDull is a cartoon. There's several movies and, and TV specials and stuff. But in terms of like TV series, there's not a lot. They have this great nostalgia and there's very particular Ooh. shows that yes. were not even that popular in japan um like gold light a favorite of yours uh -oh. right they sure, get he'll return they, on the show yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is so insane gold light is like the, the craziest stupidest idea on the, on the planet like a giant yeah. lighter and this kid's playing with this light it's like oh my only in japan hey yeah Apparently that's right. too. yeah yeah well uh, so they have this big market in hong kong for people that like a lot of people tell me, oh, you know, Bandai stuff is, you know, it's plastic and crappy. I want a real statue. Mm -hmm. So there's toy manufacturers that that target um, the that, Hong Kong is that audience. That retro and, mall you were t telling me about, like you'd take me to if I would have met up with you in Hong Kong. Is that what you're talking about? Oh no, that that is that's something different entirely. Oh, awesome. um, yeah, that that's like classic old stuff. But mm -hmm. there's a, a manufacturer called Hot Toys. Hottoys.com.hk, and I know they don't sponsor the show or anything like that. They can, um, though. They can. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Reach out. Um, but they make these super, super statues and stuff, um, not just of uh, of anime stuff, but Mar lots of Marvel and Star Wars stuff I'm seeing here at the moment. You know, but I noticed in Japan like, a lot of Marvel stuff. I, I wasn't expecting that. Like, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah, that weird. is... Like, oh, is it okay? Yeah. I mean, in Hong Kong, it's always been popular. Like the at least in twenty sixteen, sort of when I was in Japan, I noticed a lot of Marvel stuff. I was like, okay, weird. Yeah, and I'd say that's more of a newer development because generally that stuff, American superhero stuff, did not sort of sell well. Maybe the movie uh, in it, Japan brought it back, eh? Yeah. Yeah, but go ahead. What were you saying about your? Uh... No, I was just saying that there's a hot market for super high quality toys. Is that where you got your Cobra? I remember, I remember you had a Space Adventure Cobra model. Did you get it from there? Is that? Uh, a friend of mine got like a, a very expensive Cobra from there because he's a he's a super fan of, of Cobra. Um, and that's another thing. Yeah, very popular in Hong Kong. He also got this Darth Maul. And if you take a photo of it, like you could, it could really does look like it's a still from the movie. It's that so intricate. Is it like, like a hard resin? Is it kind of like a... Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes and, and I'll send you the picture. Yeah, and maybe but, definitely put, put a few pictures of like the museums here. With, we were oh, there. absolutely, yes. Cool. Uh, the, they'll all be in the show notes. By the way, uh, continuing with the toys thing, yeah, the, so lots of these shows like um, Gold Light and get these amazing, intricate statues and toys uh, made for the Hong Kong market because it's just, uh, it's still a cash cow, uh, it's still a cash cow there. And even stuff like, remember, I don't know how it's pronounced, Plores Sanshiro. Oh, yeah, Plores kind of Sanshiro. I love that show. That's a great yeah, I show. Mean, that, that was, I wouldn't say it was a bomb in Japan, but it, it didn't, it doesn't really resonate so much with I audiences. Think, but I, in that retro mall, I know that the guys gee, they had a lot on, of that stuff. The guys that work on Pokemon worked on, on that show. That's kind of the show before Pokemon. Yeah, and yeah. Um, a, a very fondly remembered in Hong Kong. So... Oh, that's, that's a fun show. And you know what? The neat thing is plot rest means play wrestlers. And they're, they're right, small, yeah. right? The fighters are small. So that's like perfect. You're yeah. getting like a life-size plot rest. Oh, cool. Yo! In 
1966, Osamu Tezuka released a manga series published in Weekly Shonen Sunday called Vampires. Now, vampires wasn't about creatures of the night that were eternal. It wasn't about people who turned into vampire bats or suck blood. No, it was about shape-shifting humans who could turn into particular animals. More like werewolves. Why didn't he call it werewolves? Anyways, vampires is not the reference I'm about to make. No. More like, hmm, Dracula, Sovereign of the Damned. Terrible film. But vampires, such as Don Dracula, if you will, to be more accurate. Vampires, like Vampire Dracula, they have something in common with Tetsuan Autumn. Whereas we know him in English, Astro Boy. To be unchanging in a world whose natural law is that all things pass, all things change. The living dead, undead, if you will. To be alive, yet to be... Something unliving, like Dear Astro. Hmm. To be alive in a different way makes you question, hmm, what is it to be a real boy? Now, we all know Tezuka was hugely influenced by Disney films, and of course, there is definitely a Pinocchio connection here to create the image of a child to become something unnaturally alive, to wish to be like a real boy. But the vampire is a shadow of something that was once alive. Once a man, like Autumn, a shadow of a boy who once was, to be their replacement, if you will, to have your own nature to be completely alien to the living world, yet here they are. But unlike Okazaki's Dracula, Sovereign of the Damned, Astro Boy definitely did not suck. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to be returning to podcasting. To my old listeners at Anime82, I would like to humbly apologize for the pod fade, but hey, stuff happens. Tonight, we introduce my first segment, a series of episodes entitled The Astro Boy World, which will be a look at Astro Boy and Astro Boy related animes. You know, I can remember as a boy in a small Midwestern town on Saturday afternoon, Astro Boy, then Thunderbirds, 2086, then turn to Channel 3 to watch Captain Harlock in Francais. If you were to tell me in the year 2020, I'd be watching that same Captain Harlock series, but this time with English subtitles on my phone on Retro Crush. I'd say, are you crazy? What's next? Gold Lighten? Streaming with English subtitles? <laughs> oh, how times have changed. So ladies and gentlemen, those were my first animes. The first anime I ever watched. My first. And on our first episode of anime specific, on the first, the first animated TV series on Japanese TV by the man who was the first in many elements of animation. The Great One. The creator of Autumn. Not Dr. Tenma, silly. I'm talking about Osamu Tezuka. And that's what we'll do a spotlight tonight. Before we start on our new series, Astro Boy World, on next episode, let's introduce his creator on our very first podcast, Osamu Tezuka. Now, we're going to be talking about anime, specifically. Wink, wink. But uh, before we get going on looking at Tezuka, let's let me make a few uh, brief notes about his his writing as a manga as a manga artist. Osama Tezuka, without question, was of high high intelligence. Not only in intellectually, but he had a great emotional intelligence, a lot of heart. You know, he could write silly and light, juvenile and innocent, and very dark and deep. And it's so amazing the world of Japanese manga and the world of Japanese animation allowed their artists this freedom which was lacking in North America at least until the late 60s early 70s and even then censored very much but Tezuka was just a genius he strove for perfection and there's a lot of trash out there in regards to anime in regards to manga but it's always nice that you can always refer back to the first and yes I know some of you are going to say there was anime TV animation in Japan before Astro Boy, but not really. So when I say it was the first, you know what I mean. But anyways, I just wanted to say when I when I first read Osama Tezuka, it touched my heart. I could really feel his emotion, and uh, it's really the beginning of my love for anime, and it's a justification for looking at manga and anime as art, which it is, you know. And the great thing about animation is. There's so many elements. You know, there's story, there's character design, there's color. You can appreciate it on many, many levels, you know. 
and are subjective. So my opinions are my own, of course. And uh, if you like something I don't, God bless. Osama Tezuka, the god of manga. And also, as we'll discover, a very, very important, perhaps the most important, in anime as well. Osama Tezuka. 1928 to 1989. Thank you, Osama Tezuka, for your greatness, for your heart, and uh, for Astro Boy. And uh, I think we could say, I think we could say, um, Astro Boy was Tezuka's life work. I mean, he may he may not like that. He he may prefer Hinotori, Bird of Fire. I think as an artist, you really are. It's up to the public, really, to the people who love you, to the societies that, you know, read you to really dictate these things and uh, I think history has shown that Astro Boy Autumn is Tezuka's life work. Now one could argue who the second most important influential person in manga anatomy is but for the, the most important as I said for influence honestly there's no question it's definitely Tezuka. Now his style is the large eyes you know the cute the cutie anime and it's definitely become the template for character design in the 80s, in the 70s, and you can still echo through to this day, you know. And uh, it's definitely apparent that Tezuka himself was influenced by Disney, Disney animation, the movement, and the character design. So after he became a successful manga artist, as we talked about, our story now begins. And it's simply amazing. Now, in 1958, Toei Animation, which is a huge company to this day, and some of my favorite... Um, anime like Galaxy Express um, which are my two favorite films the first two Galaxy Express 3.9 films from Toei Animation now Toei Animation gave Tezuka his first chance to fulfill his dream to be part of a a grand animated film you know, at this point obviously animation as we knew it at that time was mostly in the movies and uh, as I said Tezuka was influenced and a big fan of Disney and so now, here was his chance to be a part of an animated film on that level with Disney. Son Goku, The Monkey King, Tezuka's own manga version of The Journey to the West, a very famous story told many times in the East. Now, um, this was his first part of a huge production, and Tezuka is a very creative person. And I think also, he's a very obsessed and controlling person, as many artists are. And he had some big plans for this film. Not only did he want it to be beautiful, fully animated, on the level of Disney, but he wanted to have some some things that Disney didn't have. He wanted to have tragedy in a children's story. He wanted to have drama along with the good, the bad. And the very ending scene, he wanted the monkey girlfriend to die. These deep, some, these deep emotions, this could have really made this a very compelling film. But... Um, you know, he had restrictions as he wasn't the captain of this boat. And uh, definitely his ideas were edited and controlled. And like I said, he wanted to do what Disney had not. And uh, the emotional things, they kind of ixnated. They're like, nah, I don't think so. And uh, this frustrated Tezuka. He wanted to have control. So what do you do when you're a crazy, obsessed manga superstar? You start your own animation studio. Why not? I mean, just just think of it if you, if you're doing your own comics i mean it's just you the pen the paper your ideas but i mean an animated film there's so many moving parts right i mean i could see why it would be frustrating for tezuka so yeah like unlike his main experience he discovered the difficulties of working under a big corporation you know with a team of producers and writers la 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 no final say so a year later tezuka He's ready to get creative control and freedom by creating his very own studio, Tezuka Osamu Animation. Now, he got a bunch of young cats, and they started making some interesting, cool animated shorts. Nobody was seeing them, you know, but they were getting creative, kind of like my music, you know? Just do it. Do it for the love. Do it for the joy of creating, you know? But something's got to give, right? So after these interesting animated shorts, his young team went on to take on a cool manga that he he was he did in the past, and that's Astro Boy. Now, in 1962, the renamed Mushi Productions would take on that daunting task. But hey, how are we gonna do a TV series every week? 
with full animation, it's impossible unless we have an army of animators and directors and writers, but we didn't have that. So we needed a new technique, limited animation, limited movement, creating the reality of TV anime at the time. You know, in order to get the episodes out each week, limited animation with reused models made this possible. Simply put, instead of the fluid animation of Disney or some Russian films, only do the bare minimum. There's no need to have everything moving and shaking. Just the movement of the mouth or the eyes can tell the scene. And Tezuka was the first to create the limited animation process. The very first to get his animation in the North American TV market. Also, Tezuka's Jungle Emperor Leo was the very first fully colored anime on Japanese TV. Now, people have criticized anime because of this limited animation process. But uh, I assure you, Tezuka was of the highest skill. He could do anything any animator could do. And he did just that. He, he went on to create some experimental films with some adult themes, uh, works of creative uniqueness like Belladonna of Sadness and A Thousand and One Nights. I just think it's really refreshing and amazing to have so many different elements in his works, in his anime, in his manga, you know. And another unique thing was he created a cast of actors, if you will, characters who would play different parts within his manga and within his animated world. And that's really, really cool. So, Soma Tezuka, you are amazing. And uh, really crazy how many leaders of anime worked under him. Legends of animation worked under him. I mean, people like Yoshiyuki Tamino of the Gundam anime, a genius in him, in his own right. One of my favorite, Osamu Tezaki of Space Adventure Cobra. Um, even Rintaro of, once again, another one of my, well, actually my favorite animated series, Galaxy Express 3.9. Simply amazing. And Rintaro went on to direct... Uh, Something we definitely will talk about, Jetter Mars, which was the failed um, sequel or remake of Astro Boy that had to be changed. Um, so we'll definitely look at that in Astro Boy World. And that's just to name a few. I mean, he, his legacy is felt throughout the history of manga and anime. Um, his anime was filled with true quality, the spirit of the anime love. Osama Tezuka, anime's most important figure. So please, ladies and gentlemen, join me next episode as we explore, as I said, his life's work. Perhaps he wouldn't see it that way, but the world does. The Astro Boy World, next episode. If someone would have told me that Future Police Urashiman would be officially streaming somewhere, uh, you know, that, that blows me away. Whoa. And not only that, I actually... Uh, when I was in Japan, I bought this really cool Urashiman art book, and I, oh, I loved love those. it. I buy so many of those. I love those. Yeah, yeah and you go to Book Off, and you can get some that are just as good as new for half the, well, not half, but, you know, much they, less. They have those little things called looks. Are they, they call them looks. They're like littler. Is that, is that, am, I, am I right? They're like little books, and they're full of like yeah. cool. Yeah, I have a bunch of those, too. Yeah. Do they call those looks? Am I right? Am I ignorant? I can't remember what they're called, but yeah. they're actually, what, I ordered the Japanese Blu-ray of Urashiman. Uh, which that was before I, I, anyway, it's not streaming in Hong Kong anyway, but, but did, you know, did, the does Japanese that have, does that have uh, English subtitles or no, probably not. Yeah. Oh, it does. Good question. Because lots of people ask me about that. Um, I doubt it. But... When I put it on, on Twitter, because the, the Blu-ray was like, it, it came, it also came with a little book inside. It was a really cool thing. Um, but no, it does not come with yeah. English subtitles, but I've sent screen caps of me watching it with English subtitles. And then people asked, are you sure? Like, how how can you be watching it in English then? And the simple answer is that um, I have like a home theater PC, and mm. I with a Blu-ray player in it. And if you use uh, VLC or or um, Pot Player, you can just load external subs. Oh, uh, excellent! Now, usually that's as e that's that's extremely easy. However, the one thing is that with these Blu-rays, it's actually just one three-hour video file with chapters in it. It's not. 
oh. uh, each episode isn't separated. So I had to uh, combine the subtitles together and, and make sure I had the timings right and stuff oh. and turn it into one big subtitle file that's three hours long because it's like seven episodes per disc. Interesting. But, uh, is that streaming in, in Asia legally or in, 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 I know it is in North America. Yeah, and, and yeah I don't, I, I highly doubt it. I mean, Crunchyroll, there is Crunchyroll Hong Kong, but it is crap. Like yeah, it's just, just Naruto VPN, and eh? One Piece. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, nothing like that. I mean, uh, so, but having said that, like, do you remember, and this is another change I think that's that's happened, is that several years ago, Justin Savikas famously said that anime has no value. You, you know, mm. it's not worth anything. And at the time, that was absolutely true. Uh, and then, of course, we had people like Binu, <laughs> you know, going ballistic at, at that comment. Um well, I mean, I mean, obviously, that's that's somewhat subjective. I mean, I, I kind of know what he's saying, but and I, I know what you're saying too. But yeah, yeah. but on, on a massive yeah. on a massive level, on a, on a more on a consumerism or on a on a large level, maybe there's always that you know yes. those fans, like you said, like in reference to like older fans, but on a mainstream, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it was mm-hmm. something that uh, streaming still was at oh, its yeah. infancy oh, yes. or, or yeah. not developed mm-hmm. at all. Piracy or fa- or fan subs was pretty rampant and to be honest Guilty. that's how i got yeah. a lot of stuff as well because yeah. it was just so and subbing uh, for stuff mate right yeah yeah well yeah that's true and it was just so inconvenient the whole process of, of getting something whereas now you realize how fleeting all, all this streaming stuff is uh, and even digital files you know hard drives crash and yeah that's true stuff like yeah. that so i've just really found an enjoyment and an, a value in having the physical object, having yeah. the Blu-ray. And, and I think, so you I've, know, and I, I make music, the same thing with music, right? Like streaming so easy, and it's, but you have nothing physical. So now vinyl records are top sales again. Highest it's ever yeah. been. Because people want something yeah. physical. Same thing, you know? Yeah. That's right. And yeah, uh, yeah and, and you know, a, a friend of mine and a friend of the show, Brendan, he, he's, um, uh, he was one of the translators for the Fist of the North Star manga re-release. Uh, and he worked for... Oh, yeah. um, That's cool. Uh, that was yeah. pretty neat. I mean, it wasn't the best way to release it, but it's still pretty cool. I would have bought that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, I know, I know there were some technical difficulties with, with those devices and stuff. They could have been done better. But, you know, in terms of the translation, uh, like... And it was neat. Really it was a really of... neat idea. Like, I would love to get my hands on one. Something yeah, I didn't need sure. to get. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, he's really into those uh, vinyl things. And they just released the vinyl uh, for the Yurotsuka Doji uh, anime soundtrack. And... Uh-oh. Because he knows Toshio Maeda, he was able to send a whole heap of them. The official Gundam YouTube mm-hmm. was streaming Gundam, a Zeta Gundam, to completely free in Asia uh, for and with selectable Japanese, Korean, Chinese, English subtitles. It's crazy. But even then, you know, I just, you know, I really like the. I, I, I see the value in having a physical object now, and yeah, I, it's I almost think, like everything now that everything you can get anything you want. It's yes. Like, before it was like it was such a, in a way. I valued it more because it was so hard to get. I, I was a part of like a fan subbing group or I had to get it from fan subs. It was something like, this is so rare. The hunt, you kind of valued it. You're like, I have it finally. Now it's like, yeah. here it is. You're like, well, what do I want to watch? It's like, uh, yeah. you know, it makes you, it makes you reconsider things. But yeah. yeah, that's right. And I mean, on the other hand, though, one thing that I've gotten more and more sort of hardcore into is uh, preservation because there's yeah. just... And more than any other medium, anime is really something that, oh. uh, like, they they are not they're not the best preservationists. Uh, anime yeah. studio and license are lost. You never know. It's on one. If you're on, I'm watching. I'm episode twenty. Also, the license is gone. Some shows just yeah. are gone. If they're not popular yeah. enough, just okay. Poof. And you know, if some show is popular or popular in other countries, they want to make a Blu-ray or something. The masters are gone. Or they, they're lost or they're destroyed. Yes. I mean, and Project Echo, well, I'm so excited for that Blu-ray release. But uh, it's very interesting because the, the, famously the masters for Echo have been lost mm. for years and years. But they're doing something interesting. Like I know that the best quality version of Echo is certain a laser disc masters or laser disc mm. versions. And they've there's some sort of technology where they can instead of because uh, uh, laser disc is still analog. You know. The, the laser they, the laser has the information on if it, the yes. disc sends that information yeah, it, by a like laser to yeah. the analog device mm-hmm. yeah yeah but they're, they're actually doing something where they're sending the data from the laser straight to the computer so yes. they're bypassing some of that analogness that that 
so as to ensure even the, yeah, you know, the best quality they can. I mean, um, they were talking about that on the Enemy World Order where they're saying it's actually easier with the older shows than some of these uh, early 2000 shows to get high definition because of the, the, you know, the format it's made in. You know, yeah, because film, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people still don't kind of understand this, but film, uh, you know, it, it, it's proper film. I mean, there's different, but yeah, I, like movie film, is uh you know it's like 5k or something the equivalent mm. of the the, yeah. the digital equivalent of so i mean like the urashiman dvd uh, blu-rays that i bought i mean mm -hmm. super sharp image noisy as all hell though yeah um and i don't know if that's because uh japanese like if they didn't do it didn't do denoising or want to do denoising because there are definitely purists out there that that think that any sort of denoising is you know a heresy mm. um but also one thing i noticed in particular was you know, with the old four by three TVs, oh, the yes. top part of the image uh, is slightly cropped. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. with every scene change in these Urashimon Blu rays, you, yeah. you can see the damage at the top of the cells yeah. from being, you know, mm -hmm. from being printed and stuff. So, uh, you know, that's you know, I love slightly. It. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I mean, it adds to the charm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but of course, a lot um, of those shows, especially the TV shows, were made for that format. And so that's how you're going to get it. Like, that's, yes. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, I, I really, a lot of, I'm really passionate about preservation. Yeah, of, I, and I'd rather keep it in the, in the proper ratio. I don't want them chopping something. Like the atrocity no, no, of, no, no, of the no, new Astro right. Boy, 2003 yeah. Astro Boy, they just destroyed it. The North American release is just insulting. I don't even want to yeah. talk about it. My, it hurts my feelings. Yeah, I mean, there's... All oh, sorts of things, yeah, where they garbage. force it to widescreen and stuff. Screw you, Sony! Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I, I've i been doing a little side project um, where I've been playing around with the uh, different AI upscales of certain older Laserdisc OVAs. Cool. Uh, just on my own. I haven't released anything. Like, we're at the stage where a lot of these AI upscales, if they are done properly, can make a show look really good like you know there's an old ova called greed uh, which yes. was only ever released in blu-ray i've and seen it unfortunately yeah um <laughs> it's cool no it's well, cool no i mean no i i i get i get your reaction like I'm it's one kidding. of those it's a very esoteric kind of yeah no, it's know, interesting. It, it also it's... represents everything i love about the ova format oh like, yeah the it's, complete it's, disregard it's for yeah exactly yeah. yeah utterly uncommercial you know a fever dream all, all those things just like i mean california crisis which you Excellent. helped I get translated it is like an absolute favorite oh, of mine and, amazing you know, nothing like you it know, I, nothing like it i love the, nothing like those, it those and, 80s early 90s ovas are just so unique and and so interesting to look at that's what makes them so valuable and that's that, that's the part of anime i think that we really love is it's like a dream it's like someone's someone who cares about what they're doing and they're creating a dream with the colors with the movement it's not always just about the story but it's also it's about the feeling the heart like california yes. crisis it's a simple yeah. story but it's just the colors, the music, the feeling. And I mean, that's what I really love about um, anime. It brings back those feelings, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. and I, I do think, like, you know, you, you see where the American Film Registry archives stuff that's that's culturally significant. Mm -hmm. And I think they should also do the same thing for um, depictions of America. And, you know, like, yes. this is a Japanese depiction or impression of America in the 80s. And I think there's something culturally significant about that as well. And I, I think that's, you know... Yes. Um, oh, yeah. So interesting. And uh, yeah. by the way, I've got the album uh, sung by Miho Fujiwara. She she sings the California Crisis theme song, uh, or, or theme song, you know, the song. And I love that song. And yeah. by the way, uh, yeah, that was on put on YouTube. Um, it got a lot of views and a lot of people saying how awesome it is. I mean, obviously, um, Plastic Love is the biggest sort of '80s Japanese hit worldwide, but this one got a lot of attention. And she ended up replying on youtube and she's saying oh my goodness that that's me i'm so embarrassed <laughs> you know classic uh, though a lot of artists do that about the 80s but that's why we love yeah you. yeah yeah but i mean it, it, so a cool. lot of people even if they've never actually seen california crisis i mean they love that song oh and, yeah um i mean the 80s were so much fun the music the sound the feeling it's just it's great and i mean california crisis yeah. is so i wish we would have had more stuff like that but i'm just i'm glad we have it yeah yeah, and, and that's something. Yeah, I really hope. Uh, I mean, there's only so much you can do with um, with restoration and upscales based on analog sources. But the one I did of Greed, I'm I'm really quite proud of that one. Uh, it's a, probably a bit overcolored, but uh, I, I can't wait to uh, see it. 
Yeah. I mean, well, if, you I mean, don't have time to do, if you don't have time to fan sub something, send it over to Orphan. Those, that's a great fan subbing group. Plug. Yeah, well, no, Orphan, actually, I it's their you. version. Yeah, those it's guys their are version that I upscaled. Oh, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got to take a minute to thank Orphan fan subs. You guys do great work. I really yeah, appreciate they, what you guys do. I really, really love it and I appreciate it. Go check them out, guys. That's right. And, yeah. and Orphan will flat out say how terrible something that they sub is. And I'm not talking about uh, greed yeah. in particular, but yeah. I'm just saying that they'll say, oh, this this is probably one of the worst OVAs ever made, but blah, 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 blah. enjoy, you know, it, it's... Um, yeah, and I love Orphan. I like, Orphan's doing, like, we did box fan subs. It didn't last. Yeah. But my idea, my hope with box fan sub, which I was a small part of, was just to do all the crazy OVAs from the 80s. That was my dream. Yep. So it's so cool to see Orphan doing just that. They, they put out all this unique stuff, and it's, it's so cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for those fan subs that are still out there bringing us those 80s gems and just keep yeah. mastering it and guys like Dane, you know, so I appreciate it because uh, I'm definitely I'm, not doing it now. But I I, I'm it. just remastering like as a hobby. And yeah, that's cool. I, I don't necessarily plan to to put those things out on the internet only because... Oh, you better under a different uh, name. Yeah, well, I mean, I, it's just that, yeah, in re it's not a, about the legality of it because I don't think... Um, yeah, Anyone definitely don't bring in it up because we don't want our, our sponsors, Hot Toys, to get mad at us. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Um, uh, so, and that's actually why Alex isn't here. He's playing with some hot toys of his own. But um, very exciting. Yeah, <laughs> but okay. uh, people get quite aggressive about perceived ownership of of certain things. You know, like oh, the, hey, these masters came from me, or you're using my translation and whatnot. So, I mean, that's that's kind of what I'm. Oh, yeah. That's why I'd Fair be enough. nervous about publicly releasing a lot of these upscales under. Um, yeah, well, you could always. Know, unless you could I was always, completely uh, anonymous. You could always. Anonymous. You could always contact a group and just put like, "Oh, I'll put my name and your name or something like that." Too. They're, they're usually pretty cool about stuff yeah. like that. But but either way, I think that's a really cool hobby, man. I think that's awesome. Yeah, well, and, and you know, obviously, some things are only upscales, released on VHS, and some things are just on, sometimes they have a laser disc, but sometimes it's just VHS. Yeah, and who knows and if I, it's a master? Find, you know. Yeah, I find that these upscales generally look the best from a um, Laserdisc source, uh, just because uh, with the Laserdisc source, uh, with the Laserdisc source, it's you know it's subpar compared to DVD, and it's usually the colors usually washed out. It's yeah, you got to you know, be careful with with the upscale because you can you can lose detail, you know. But, but yeah, yeah, and and. and so, you know, it's mostly color, contrast, mm -hmm. correction, just a bit of sharpening of the image. And a lot of these upscalers now, yeah, they, they don't, they don't, you don't lose any detail, but obviously there's, if there's no detail in the image, it's not going to magically put wrinkles on someone's face or something. But sometimes they do have these certain algorithms that try and create detail where it isn't there and it might, it might look strange. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's something that you've just got to, you know, carefully look at. But, you know, cool. I'll see how that goes. Yes, I, I I want to see it anyways, and and uh, definitely uh, we'll we'll definitely review some crazy OVAs on it. At least I I think we should definitely look at some of the crazy, Absolutely, interesting, yeah. unique, kooky OVAs from the eighties and nineties, which makes right, Japan that, so unique and special with their animation. Th that's the the other thing. Speaking of preservation, when not only at a time when becoming more important as you know, laser discs rot and mm. time goes on, and and these things become less and less accessible, but I've also like generally yes I I watch subtitled versions mm -hmm. but I do have a lot of nostalgia for the manga UK dubs yeah, which yeah and sometimes uh, I prefer so, a dub uh, sometimes yeah yeah I, I I will go on the record as saying absolutely if Ooh. for the right show uh I really really love a good dub especially if it, if it sort of matches the show and I think yeah manga UK dubs were famous for like being well acted, I think, but also being outrageous at times. I mean, Cyber City Oedo was a good example of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, and that's also getting a Blu-ray release with it's the um, with the dub as well. Crazy. But I mean, yeah, there are some things that I never realised had an American and a UK dub uh, mm -hmm. in Australia. I always had the UK dubs of these. Interesting. Things. So, I'm sure over here, uh, most of them would be the American over here. Yeah. Sometimes um, Canadian, eh? Yes, like Astro Boy, yeah. Of course. Yeah, he's Astro Boy. There's cases where yeah, some dubs go out of print or, or they're associated with uh, licenses that are not the current license holder. Lost like forever, the like the Labor. original Akira dub, you know? Right. Stuff and, like that, um, yeah. And I think the, the Pat Labor, the Pat Labor films, one and two, 
have the Manga UK version, that that dub is just like perfection to me. The voices, the acting quality, the script. Although again, uh, sometimes they get uh, Manga got a little bit um, of flack for changing the scripts, but I think when you're adapting something, yeah. Uh, it's got to sound idiomatic. And I think that's the problem with a lot of newer dubs mm. is that they want to preserve some of the, the Japanese-ness and there's a big reduction of sort of idiomatic dialogue and it, it, yeah. it, you I can mean, close your eyes and know that you're listening to and, dubbed anime. And a translation in itself is sort of an adaptation. You know, you, you, some words you can't say in one yeah. word. You know, so. That's right. And uh, as I've learned more and more Cantonese, People would often ask me, "What what's the English version of this?" And then there just there just isn't. You're like, have uh, a bit of an understanding. Yeah, yeah, that's so uh, true. So, so I, I agree with you. I agree with you. What you're saying, yeah. you know, it, it's it's better to do an adapt adaptation that works for your language than yep. you know. But I mean, it depends, I guess. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you know that I remember, you know, there was a, a show in a jump comedy show called Bo 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 Bo. Bo. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, which is is really funny. But I remember mm -hmm. I tried to watch the dub of that, and there was one episode where uh, it involved I don't know some sort of special noodles or special ramen, and in the dub they changed it to spaghetti. And yeah. I just thought, well, come on. Why do you need to do that? You know that that sort of stuff pisses me off. Or, or like Doraemon coming out, um, and they they had digitally changed the one hundred yen coins to like a, a, a quarter or something. You know, so Americans uh, can understand. Maybe. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. I mean, I had to know what a dime was when I was two, although it doesn't exist in Australian currency. So well, I think what about a toonie, eh? <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, there's no pennies in Canada. So, right, yeah. We used to have them, but uh, not anymore. Toonies and loonies, eh? You gotta go stateside for that, buddy. Cool. Yeah. And yeah. speaking um, of Akira, I just wanted to talk about uh, the, uh, the theatrical re release. Uh, in celebration of the 4K remaster, Ooh. I was very fortunate, obviously living in a place where people actually shock, wear masks, and uh, maintain nice. the proper hygiene and social distancing. So when Akira came out for re-release, it was just when theatres started to reopen in Hong Kong, albeit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you can't sit next to anyone, etc., etc. But Even I managed better. to take my daughter. Mm. Yeah. I, it, I took my daughter to see the 4K remaster. Now, no, how old? Do, no, how old is your daughter right now? She's two and a half. No, just kidding. No, she's eleven. So, um, so it'd be interesting. What does she think of Akira? Just before you go on, like at her age, what was her take on it? Did she? What, did she get? Yeah, well, she's used. To, she's she's grown up with the notion that cartoons are not just for kids. Yeah, it's crazy uh, cartoons again. Yeah, um, and you know, like I said, when she was very young, she watched. Uh, Project Aiko, and she enjoyed that. And I got no problem. Like, I don't have this American Judeo Christian shame about nudity or anything like that. You know, there's boobs bouncing around in Aiko sometimes, but you know, that, I don't care about that. And it's not like, you know, anyone's got their legs open or anything. Um, mm -hmm. But so the thing, yeah, I was sort of worried about Akira's violence. But then I remembered I saw it when I was 11, and lots of people I know. Yeah, I saw um, it when I was young too. I mean, that was the yeah. first anime I saw on, on uh, VHS. I was like, what is yeah. this? Yeah. So, so I, I just sort of said all right whenever something really violent happens i'll nudge her and warn mm -hmm. her funnily enough for the most part she was not so much to my surprise she was not squeamish about that at all what really freaked her out though was, was sort of the tetsuo metamorphosis body horror aspect she she that yeah. freaked her out a bit but i mean to see it on the big screen with the proper speakers that soundtrack and everything it's just like it's just such a mind-blowing experience uh, and and it's, this is speaking as someone who's seen the film I don't know, a hundred times. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually so, saw it in theaters too. Because uh, actually here in Canada, they do play anime randomly, Just but they do it like, it'll be once a month, a few sh a few animes, and it'll just be on a Tuesday. Yeah. You can go one showing on a Tuesday. And I did catch Akira. It's one of the shows I did catch. Yeah, yeah I mean, just to see it on the big screen mm -hmm. uh, with the, the re like all the remastered sound and the Excellent. top quality. Yeah. Um, it, it's just... Yeah, I mean, it's just a mind-blowing experience. So, so when you watch it in in Hong Kong, was it would it be in, would it be in Japanese with the subtitles, or do they have a Cantonese sub? Or the version I saw was in Japanese with Chinese and English subtitles. Oh, um, cool. Which, yeah, I mean, like I've, I've said before in Anime Pacific, uh, if you're into Asian cinema, Hong Kong is usually one of the best places to go to because all the films are shown 
uh, with Chinese and English subtitles. So, you know, if you like Korean films or Japanese films and, and stuff, it's it's definitely a good place. Yeah, I noticed that when I, I actually got a, a Gamera film, for, in a, it was only released in with English subtitles from the, the Hong Kong release, Gamera the Brave, and it had uh, the Cantonese and English all on the bottom. I noticed that. Oh, yeah. 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 So, Hard and, 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 yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. So and, and in terms of what my daughter thought about it, like she went through a phase where she really liked watching uh, animated films and anime and stuff. And yeah. she's, she seems to, she's not, not really big into anime anymore. That's okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, she's doing her own thing, whatever, whatever her interest is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I certainly don't want to like, you, you know, I, I've exposed her to them and she yeah. has good memories of that, but you know, she's not necessarily going to be someone like me, but she, she's doing a lot of sort of animation on her own. Cool. Like she, she really enjoys the process of, of animating and she's learning live 2D and stuff. Well, maybe, so and I'm sure in the, in, the, in the future, when she's a little bit older, she'll she'll probably come back to anime because of that. Yeah, well, you know, and she, she's watching different types of, of animation and she I think she she seems quite attracted to the stuff like, you know, Hearthstone. Um, if you see the, the opening uh, movies for those different Hearthstone expansions and stuff, she she's... She's liking a lot of so-called Western stuff, but, but you know, as someone with an appreciation for hand-drawn uh, animation, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. she said that the that, that like animation of, uh, Western was Western animation too. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, she, she yeah, she said that Akira's animation was amazing. Oh, so she could um, appreciate that. So she she said to you, "Wow, it was really cool. Like the animation was cool." That's a bit oh, a yeah, hard she, for her to understand. Like that's kind of a complex story for eleven-year-old to wrap their head around. Like it's pretty intense. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I, I think part of the reason was while I have. Daddy, certain, why, is like, that, I, why is that man's arm expanding? Why is he eating <laughs> the world? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have an affection for the old dub, but one thing the old dub. Oh, yeah. It was bad. Did not explain several things. Yeah. At like all. when I first watched um, it as a kid, I was like, huh? I was like, what? They have yeah. Motorcycles. And the, the subtitled version makes it a, a bit easier to understand. Uh, and I don't know. I, I discussed the story with her, and she really seemed to get it. Oh, so cool. I definitely will not be I mean, showing my son that for a while. He's only four, and he's. I showed him that. I tried to find the cutest episode of Astro Boy with the elephant, and that freaked him out. So I'm like, okay, he's not ready for Akira yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I. My daughter. I mean, because Hong Kong, as you know, the living space is, um, not not as big as Canada by by a long shot. So, uh, you know, yeah. even. <laughs> Watch your There'd dog run away for three TV. days here, guys. Yeah. I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah. There'd be stuff on the TV that, you know, she, she'd she see. Uh, obviously, oh. you know, I wasn't mm -hmm. watching yeah. uh, uh, hardcore porn or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, just softcore. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Okay. Uh, see, uh, on the TV there, <laughs> no, eh? Just kidding. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, she's Some been... violence or uh, what have you, like a little not, bit on not, TV? Not, not violence. No, I mean, like, I was always careful about that, but I... I'd show her, like, I'd be watching, I don't know, Star Trek or, or Star mm -hmm. Wars or Hellboy or something with lots of fantastical creatures in it. So she's just, she's always grown up with images of, of aliens and monsters and stuff. I mean, when she was little, she really liked the Ridley Scott film Legend. Um, I love that film. I love it. I love that film too. And she People really it. liked it. it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, she must be cool. So, cool. yeah, she, she's been used to the images of, of strange creatures since she was very little. Um, and, you know, and there was one like nine or no, one 10 year old that came over once and saw Ewoks, Ewoks, uh, and he hid behind the sofa. <laughs> awesome. so, yeah. Wait till you see Jar Jar kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I would have loved to see yeah. that. I would have, that would have been amazing. Like kid crying about Ewoks. It's awesome. Yeah. It'd be a great but, uh, I mean, and I'm guessing that kid had the, the sort of parents that I don't know <laughs> read the newspaper or read very boring fictional books or, or non-fiction. I don't know. You know, there's just no exposure to anything outside. Yeah, of the well, I was traumatized as a child because my my brother's a little bit older than me, and he watched a lot of like horror movies and stuff. And my parents were just like, "Yeah, go with your brother." I'm just like traumatized by seeing stuff like Jason and stuff like, Ooh. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things know that all about it defines 80s childhood is a healthy dose of trauma yeah um, yeah go around your mic yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean I, I, these days if if a kid goes to the playground across the road then yeah that's the, true you know, right
Remember that episode of The Simpsons when Troy McClure rejected the offer to star in McBean 4 and instead he starred in and produced his own film called The, Contra- the Contrabulous Fabtraction of Professor Horatio Huffnagel? Remember that hilarious dated font and style? No matter the affection that you may have felt for that aesthetic and style, it's funny because it was clearly something from a bygone age. And in many ways, the contrabulous subtraction of Professor Horatio Huffnagel conjures up similar thoughts to how people view Tatsunoko Productions. Even in 1983, when Future Police Urashimon, which I'm reviewing now, came out, Tatsunoko was the hot stuff of yesterday. It was one of the reigning kings of the 60s and the 70s, with stuff like Makgogo, aka Speed Racer, of course, Gatchaman, which came out various times, but most notably as Battle of the Planets in a heavily censored form, Kashan, the Time Bokan, and the Yataman, just to name a few. And Yataman was hugely popular in Hong Kong and remains so to this day. When you think about Tatsunoko, it really conjures up the sort of costumed superheroes that were popular back in the 70s, coupled with a certain degree of I can't believe this is a kid's show level of violence. And also some pretty mild but definitely lewd humour. Yataman, for example, and that's one of the things people remember the most about it. And then there was the adventures of Hutch the Honeybee, quite possibly the cutest and most innocuous sounding names of all time, is legendary in its cruelty. But by the 80s, Tatsunoko was still definitely producing popular anime, but nothing really as iconic as its products of the 60s and 70s. The Wikipedia entry for Future Police Urashimon stated, without citations I should add, that Urashimon saved the studio from bankruptcy, but let's just get this out of the way, that's not true. As a matter of fact, Dash Cafe, which I know Regan likes, that was produced a year prior to Urashimon. It was so successful that it had a pretty profound influence on the development of Urashimon itself a very 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 loose adaptation of a manga that was still in production when the cartoon was being made as a matter of fact hiroshi soda the manga's creator was heavily involved in the tv show as well so it was not a case of them taking his baby away and changing it into something that didn't resemble what he had intended he was definitely complicit in a lot of the changes that were made and the first half of the manga was actually pretty hard sci-fi it was very different both um, tonally and artistically to the TV series. However, halfway through its four volume run, Soda actually changed the illustrator and tone pretty much completely to be closer to the anime adaptation. So of course the anime definitely surpassed the manga in popularity. These days it's actually pretty hard to find copies of it. There are some, in fact there are some in French as well. Initially, the hard sci-fi element was supposed to be part of the TV series, Kunio Okawara, one of the, if not the god of mecha designs, serves as the mechanical designer for the series. There were lots of toys released to quite a bit of popularity, and there was definitely, originally, it was intended for there to be a sizable mecha element to this TV series, but that kind of got scrapped when they moved towards more of a comedic bent. If I were to describe Urashimon to someone who didn't no anime very well and was near my age i'd say oh, it's kind of a japanese inspector gadget in some ways so the, it's the story it's talking about a young man and his cat and he's being chased by the police in 1983 the year this was made and then he suddenly drives his car right in the middle of some sort of cyclone and is caught in a space-time anomaly and then he ends up him and the cat end up in the year 2050 where the bulk of the story takes place So suffering from more or less complete memory loss, he soon finds that he's being pursued by the army-like forces of Necrime, a top-secret criminal organization led by Ludwig, who is one of the, if not the main villain of the series. Taking the name Ryu Urashima, the young man joins the police force and fights back against Necrime. Then he is joined in the fight by Sophia, who is actually a nun, and she, she joins the series pretty early on, and Claude, this sort of blonde, blonde haired, blue eyed, dashing police officer. So I guess the Tokyo of the future called Neo Tokyo, T-O-K-I-O, is quite a cosmopolitan place. And then there's Inspector Gondo and the cat, just called Meow, because that's the sound it makes. Uh, And the cat made the time journey with Hiroshimon. So what we know about Necrime is that 
it seems to control cl crime all across the world. And the leader is this mysterious figure called the Führer. Yes, the Führer. And this ghostly white man called Ludwig, who is probably the real bad guy of the series. Uh, and Ludwig is the second in command. Ultimately, it is Ludwig and the Führer that become the show's most fascinating characters. And it's this aspect of the show that receives a lot of praise to this day, the development of the villains in the series. Rio and Claude are definitely amusing, to be sure. They're likable characters, and their relationship is certainly an enjoyable aspect of the show. But it's really the backstory and motivations of the Führer and Ludwig that make the story. The character of Sophia is a good addition to the series, and is affectionately remembered by a lot of female fans because she's rarely a Mary Sue, a love interest, or seen as any less important than, quote-unquote, the boys. Ludwig's love interest accomplice was also a notable female character that was elegant, intelligent, yet possessing a very unconventional, untraditional beauty. Ludwig's right-hand man, Jitanda, seems like he's about 12 years old and is also a very interesting character. Each of Ludwig's main agents, Stinger, Wolf, Cat, Hawk, Shark, and Bear, are given pointedly distinctive character designs and moments. In fact, it was one of the mission statements from the character designer, Takashi Nakamura, who I'll be talking a lot more about. Despite being one of only three character designers credited, most of the final main character designs of the main characters were done by him. Nakamura had worked as a key animator on Genma Taisen and was heavily influenced by Katsuhiro Otomo's character designs. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I do not think that Genma Taisen is not a very good film, but it absolutely made a huge, huge impact that can't be understated. The aesthetics of that film, coupled with Otomo's character designs and the extreme attention to detail, became one of the defining characteristics of anime in the 80s. The character designs were pointedly made more Otomo-esque, with smaller eyes and more realistic features of the main characters. It's no surprise that Nakamura was heavily involved in Robot Carnival as well, which in my mind is like the poster child of the insane attention to detail animator one-upmanship that was prevalent in the 80s. Nakamura actually worked on Gold Lighten, which came out a few years before, and that really impressed the chief director, Koichi Mashimoto, who would also go on to be chief director of Orashimon. Yes, that Koichi Mashimoto, the founder of B-Train, and one of the people who helped make production IG, itself a Tatsunoko subsidiary, originally into what it is today. He's directed some absolute classics, especially in the 80s and early 90s. Dirty Pair Project Eden, Dominion, The Irresponsible Captain Tyler, which is probably the best Hatsunoko TV show of the 90s, and possibly some of the best, or one of the best anime TV shows of the 90s period. Later on, he directed Noir, which people kind of either love or hate, and then a seemingly endless collection of hack anime, remember that hack, which uh, no one really seems to talk about anymore, but there were dozens of those shows. The last thing he directed was the anime adaptation of Hyoge Mono, which is something that would definitely be up my alley, and I've read some of the manga, and I went to a town in Japan that surprisingly had a lot of Hyoge Mono stuff there, so it's something I'd like to know more about. I actually own a DVD box set of Hyoge Mono, but I've never watched it. Uh, but anyway, one can definitely see something of a pattern here, science fiction comedy. Mashimoto was the master of balancing sort of the idiosyncrasies of science fiction as well as comedy and heart. And for the first half of the show, and a lot of the second half as well, it is very much an episodic crime of the week kind of a show. Uh, Necrime plans some elaborate caper and the mobile police bumble around and put a stop to it usually. There's the quintessential sci-fi episodes like the body swap episodes, the good guy framed on the run, etc, etc. And it's kind of really pointless for me to go through each episode given the episodic nature. So instead, I'd just rather focus on the show's best episode, or at least one of the show's best episodes, that exemplify the show at its best from both a writing and a production standpoint. In fact, it ranks up there, in my opinion, as one of the most wonderfully produced animated television episodes. And that's episode 26, so pretty much exactly halfway through the episode 50 episode run. And it was called Using the Hell Train, which is setting out for New Tokyo. Of course, it depends on the translation that you read. Made exactly as the show had reached the halfway mark, it was animated by both the aforementioned Takahashi Nakamura and Atsuko Fukushima, one of the most prominent female animators in Japan. 
they were definitely an animation dream team, if ever there was one. I mean, look at Space Adventure Cobra, another favorite of mine, lavishly animated and produced. Uh, and that's a real visual feast and a good example of what they are capable of on a TV budget. It should be noted that Nakamura and Fukushima both did key animation on Akira, with Nakamura himself heavily influenced by Katsuhiro Otomo's character designs and art. And he did the character designs for Akira in the end, adapting Otomo's uh, unique art style into um, animation. So in that episode, episode 26, the Shinkansen, which you know is, one of, is the pride of Japan for a lot of people and train nuts all around the world, uh, it was being decommissioned and that was going to be after one final run. And interestingly enough, um, when I was researching sort of the history of that episode, a lot of Shinkansen nuts were discussing it and the model, and I've forgotten the model number already, but it was decommissioned almost 20 years after the show ended, so in about 2003. So Necron wanted to cause chaos and disrupt the final run by blowing up the tracks and destroying the tracks and the train. The action, the animation, the choreography and art were all absolutely outstanding. Generally, back in the day, it wasn't really until the halfway mark of a 50-episode show, then it's very normal to have a 50-episode show, um, that the, you know, at that stage, we know if the show, or that they're in the stage of the production where they know if the show is a success or not. And usually, uh, more artistic freedom can uh, flourish in this case. There's a lot of high-speed action on top of the Shinkansen, a lot of destruction and exciting speed bike sequences, none of which are particularly easy to animate, especially with the budgetary and time constraints of TV animation. If there is one episode that really needs to be seen, I think it's this one. The show takes a lot, uh, many more interesting artistic detours in the second half, though, most likely as a result of huge success and the greater freedom afforded to those creating it. And one notable segment in one of the latter half episodes was during a chase that literally turns into a Charlie Chaplin movie. It's done really brilliantly and lovingly. And it's little artistic flourishes like this that should be archived and celebrated, I think. And to be sure, with an episode, episodic TV anime like this, some episodes are better than others and some are more memorable than others. Television anime seldom has such flourishes today, though. It's less auteur-driven and more committee-driven, at least in my imagination or in my opinion. One Japanese reviewer said it best when he said it's not necessarily the greatest anime, but it's definitely a historically significant one. And to be sure, Urashimon was extremely popular. It was the biggest hit Tatsunoko had had since the 70s. At least one that wasn't a continuation of the Time Bokan franchise, for example. During Tatsunoko's 50th anniversary, which was already quite a few years ago, actually, Tatsunoko asked viewers to vote on which series should be re-aired as part of the celebrations, and Urashimon was the clear winner. The increase, this increased attention brought something of a semi-renaissance of Urashimon merchandise, such as the uh, art book, which I also own, and the Japanese Blu-ray set, which is what I use for this review. And that also included a very cool little book that discusses the mechanical designs, character designs, and episode guide and whatnot. Um, but interestingly, no sequels were made for this. Though rumors of a film languished for a few years, it never really got off the ground. It was quite popular in Germany and several European countries. I know Saban... Um, apparently dubbed it, but backed out at the last minute in terms of releasing it. And it's kind of strange because I do think this would have been one of the easier titles to localize considering the body count is practically zero until about halfway through the series. And even then, it's more of the Robotech ships blowing up and explosions than people getting shot in the head or anything like that. Robotech was actually far more violent in comparison. Uh, in regards to the voice actors, and this is something I don't really touch upon in my reviews so much, but... There was definitely some interesting choices made, or more specifically, an interesting choice. Um, you know, uh, despite being surrounded by VA veterans such as the great Akira Kamiya as Claude, the creators pointedly wanted a sort of a more untraditional voice type for Rio, who, for all intents and purposes, is the main, main, main character of the show. And that uh, the voice of Rio was done by Michitaka Kobayashi, uh, and this is by far his most prolific role. He's still working today. And he's been constantly working since Urashimon and before Urashimon. But it's pretty much, uh, this is definitely his most prolific role. As a matter of fact, he's much more of a, what we, I guess we could say, a character voice actor, for lack of a better word. Pretty much every single role before and after Urashimon were as soldiers, heavies, teachers, monsters, coaches, etc. You know, you look at his um, 
filmography or his voiceography, and uh, it's pretty much, you know, doorman, guard, soldier, etc., etc. Mostly unnamed characters, anyway. Now, my Japanese is nowhere near enough to provide a thorough analysis of his acting, but several Japanese reviewers agree that he is not of the caliber, not at the same caliber caliber of most of the other actors on the show, but at the same time he brought something unique to the character, like a certain presence that made him a bit memorable in that role. And in many ways that's a good way to describe the show itself. Tatsunoko these days is a studio that's largely fueled by the nostalgia for its classic franchises, like Yataman, Time Bokan, Kashurn, just to name a few. Samurai Pizza Cats, which is really popular overseas as well, is also a Tatsunoko show by the way. I'm omitting their co-productions, uh, which includes Evangelion, which a lot of people forget was actually a co-production with Gainax. But looking at Tatsunoko's uh, 50th anniversary poster from a few years back, uh, it features Urashimon on the front. And I'm also reminded that he was pretty much the, the newest character or the most recent character in their classic pantheon of characters. So, I mean, I think that does say something about how rooted in the past and nostalgia the Tatsunoko brand really is. And apart from classics like Tyler, a lot of what has sustained Tatsunoko, or at least in the 90s, were darker OVA reimaginings of their classic shows like Gatchaman, Hurricane Polymar, Kashan, etc. It's affectionately remembered, but seldom spoken about much. I think Damage Girl in the um, My Anime list, she gave a provided a review for the show, and I think she said it best, which was that the series was made at a time when Japan took science fiction seriously and allowed a lot more room to navigate than they do today, and the result is a free-form, futuristic show that combines elements of police work, time travel, and pathos on the part of the villains. At 50 episodes, the series is exactly as long as it needs to be, and it provides a fun romp through a possible fruit future through the presence of a 1980s-era boy and his cat. So I think, yeah, that's a pretty good review of the series. And as I said, it's definitely something that's historically relevant. I don't know if there are any plans for a Blu-ray in the USA or in other places, I know it's streaming on High Dive, so, you know, I don't know if it's going to be everybody's cup of tea. It's something that I have always enjoyed, thus I bought the Blu-rays for it after watching the fan subs many, many, many years ago. I don't know about the High Dive version. The Blu-ray version was extremely noisy, and, you know, there were noticeable noticeable damage on the edge of the cells, but I'm told that's from the, the original scanning process back in the 80s, you know, the top of the cells would get scratched in the in the scanner, and uh, those parts were usually cropped anyway. Because if you remember, the four by three would those TVs often cropped a little bit of the image at the top and the bottom. So uh, I would definitely recommend you at least check out some of the episodes, uh, twenty six especially, just from a you know if you're just interested in animation in general, it's definitely a good episode to check out, especially knowing who was involved in the creation of that episode. So, uh, yeah, that's Future Police Urashimon. Uh, you can get it on High Dive, or you can get the Japanese Blu-ray. However, you'll have to use some sort of software to load your own subtitles, like I did, because uh, obviously the Japanese Blu-ray does not have English subtitles. So, that's my review of Future Police Urashimon. <laughs> So don't forget, uh, you guys uh, can email us at anyspecific at gmail.com. Visit the website at animespecific.blogspot.com. And uh, if you've got anything you want to discuss, if you want to be a guest, you're not crazy, then uh, let us know. You know, we're, we're open to lots of different things. Yeah, and, and yeah, any ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Yep, any requests. And we'll get a Twitter feed and we'll... Uh, we'll be on Spotify. We're not yet. We're gonna. We'll have all that information for you in the further further weeks yep. to come here. Yes, and it's a, it's. Uh, I'm very excited to be doing this show with Dane, and uh, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. The anime love lives on anime specific. Yes, it does. Stronger than ever. Yes. Excellent. <laughs>